Good evening, welcome to the program. For a government behind in the polls, struggling to sell its first budget, a shift to national security should have been a chance for some respite, a chance to get on the front foot. Instead, the government has become mired in a debate over this plan to store so-called metadata and make it available to spy agencies as part of the fight against terrorism. There is confusion, however, over what metadata is, how far this reach could go, is it a breach of privacy? Well, we're going to look at that tonight, some of the other big issues of the week. We're joined by Paul Fletcher. He is the government's parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Communication. Uh, Jane Caro, author and commentator. Julian Lisa, the former head of the Menzies Research Centre. And Stephen Jones, the shadow parliamentary secretary for regional development and infrastructure. Welcome to you all. Yes. Paul Fletcher, you have a background, of course, in this very field as an executive at Optus. And you are the Parliamentary Secretary, as I say, uh, for communications. Can I ask you to explain what metadata is? Well, uh, metadata is the data that's uh, generated as part of a piece of communication, but it's not the communication itself. So if I make a phone call to you, then in the telco industry jargon, I'm the A party, you're the B party, and the metadata includes the, num the A party's number, the B party's number, uh, time of call, duration of call, where the A party was located, where the B party was located. That, that's pretty um, easy to understand that. What happens then when we talk about um, my internet activity? Well, just before we come to internet activity, and can I make the point, that data gets generated automatically right. as part of the way a network operates. Uh, that's the first point to make. And then the second point to make is that um, under the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, um, there is today a process under which uh, the security agencies or the police can request that information uh, from the carriers if the statutory tests are met right. about the seriousness of the offence they're investigating. They need a into. warrant to do it. Uh, it, it either a, a warrant or a stored communication request, but there's a, there's a set of processes in the Act, there's a set of tests that have to be met to seek that information, and that information uh, is then uh, provided by the carriers, and the issue is that um, they will store that information for their own business purposes for a period of time, and if they have it, they'll make it available. So that's how the okay. system works for today calls. for phone calls. And with, uh, for example, uh, an email exchange, similarly, the metadata is things like the headers and so on. Um, and the distinction really that's, dra that's drawn is between the metadata and the content of the communication. Now, it's important to make the point um, exactly which bits of metadata, the full scope of what is included, is a matter of detail that's to be determined. In other words, what the Prime Minister and the Attorney General have announced this week. So, is this has, okay, this is the important bit. This hasn't been determined yet what level of metadata would be available? Well, th there are levels of detail to be sorted out, which is perfectly normal when it comes to setting policy in an area that's complicated like Is that this. what's driving the confusion here? This hasn't yet been worked out by the government? Well, I'm just saying there's a perfectly normal process going on, which is that you announce the, the policy in terms of the broad uh, level of principle, and then there's some details to work out. Okay, so what's your understanding of it at the moment? Because would it mean, for example, the websites uh, I visited for the last two years would would be stored and available. Well, look, the, both the Prime Minister and the Attorney General have, have articulated um, the, the broad principle is that the, we're, we're... Well, they've said slightly different things, well, so I'm just wondering the, what, what the position... Can, can I just say the principle that's been articulated is the content of the communication is not going to be required to be stored. It's the metadata, the data but about what, what the communication. What does that mean? Does it mean the websites and, I visited and then what are I'm stored? Gonna, well, simply what I'm going to say beyond that is there's now a process of working through the details. So Attorney General George Brandis, together with the Communications Minister Malcolm Turnbull, okay, this is um, an, are working on this. I understand that, but this is an important point. through that detail. As of tonight, yep. Thursday night, uh, what are we, two days on from the announcement, so, we don't know whether this would include websites. Uh, well, the, the key point that both the Prime Minister and the Attorney General have, the statement of principle that they have repeatedly made is that we are not seeking, the, the, it's not proposed that there be a statutory requirement to retain the content of the communication. But does that mean websites? Well, uh, the individual browsing history is, is where there's been some questions asked and the statement of principle is that that is not included in the content. 
So we're after the metadata, not the content of the communication. But again, I emphasise the point, the detail is to be worked through. And uh, Attorney General George Brandis, also working with uh, Minister for Communications Malcolm Turnbull, are consulting with okay, industry. So this is one thing you're working through. I just want to be clear on this um, so that everyone knows, yeah. and our viewers as well. Uh, the, the question of whether websites would be recorded is still being worked through. Uh, what I'd say is, as a general principle, is a, an originating IP address, for example, uh, understood to be included in metadata? Yes, it is. But the key point I'm making is... But the website? The, the precise scope. Well, then you have a linkage between an IP address and a website. But the, the point and, and, that, and that's the, but, that's the point here, isn't it? You can link from an IP address but, to a website, can't you? But, David, can I make the point? There are two issues. One is, what's the broad, generic definition of metadata? The other is, what is the detail that would be included in the legislation? And the point I'm making is there's a process to go through to work that out. So I'm not going to be, I'm not here okay. now. But as rule, far as you're aware, this hasn't been worked out I'm yet. not going to, I am not going to sit here and rule in and out. No, I appreciate what, that. What I'm included. just wondering where we're at. But what I can where we're at tonight, where we're at tonight is yeah. it, it's still a work in progress. What I, it, what I can describe to you, that's exactly right. The, the, what the Prime Minister has said is that the Attorney General has been tasked to work with stakeholders, including the uh, telecommunications industry, the telcos and the ISPs, to uh, work through the detail of this, mm. to come up with a data protection regime. Uh, so the broad uh, principle has been stated. The Attorney General has been given that job. Malcolm Turnbull's communications minister is involved in that. There's consultation going on with uh, the telecommunications industry and others. And again, I make the point, that is perfectly normal. It's a perfectly normal process in developing policy in a complicated area okay. like this. Now, I'm no expert on uh, metadata uh, or indeed on uh, fighting terrorism, but Jane, I would imagine if you're going to collect any data, it's pretty important actually to collect the websites that people might have been on. Otherwise, why bother? Uh, it strikes, as I understand it, and I've only heard what other people have heard, mm. it is possible to reconstruct the whole history of the content from the metadata the IP address from the IP address so and, and that would strike me as sensible because what is the point in having a meaningless IP address unless you actually go and find out I mean surely you want to know if the guy you're um, investigating has been on how to make a bomb go, exactly. exactly has been on jihadi.com <laughs> or uh, how to make a bomb.com yeah. that's what you want to know yeah, absolutely so it seems to me obviously they're going to look at certain people's browsing history what strikes me as peculiar though is that there's any concept left that we really have any privacy i don't i really don't know that that actually exists anymore and as the internet expands i mean you can't walk down the street without being filmed you know that there is just not real privacy as we remember it when I was young anymore. And this I, personally doesn't and, bother me And much. I do just want to pick up on that point to come back to something I said earlier. Uh, large amounts of data are generated in the process of operating a network, be it for phone calls or internet browsing sessions or, or, or email or whatever it might be. Um, and to, that's generated just in the course of the way the system works and that today there is an obligation on the carriers and the internet service providers if they receive a request and it meets the statutory test to provide that information. So, so already that, that happens, doesn't right. it? Right, and it's extensively used by the police. And, and, but they, again, uh, they, need, they need a warrant to do that. They need either a warrant or a stored communication request. And is, so is your understanding there would be any change to that, 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 that police or intelligence agencies would still need that sort of approval, a warrant. Oh, certainly that that principle. There's no suggestion of a change to that principle. Okay, so we're not really talking about a big change here. The the, the principle uh, change which is in issue here is to impose a requirement to store the data mm. on the telecommunications companies and the internet service provider for two years. But the, the the way it's accessed wouldn't change. That's fundamentally right. Yes. The response to this has been hysterical and out yeah. of all proportion, I think, by by some people. I, mean, I think what Jane is saying is is broadly right. When you get a person like Brett Walker, who's the National Security Monitor, who's an independent silk of high standing, no friend of the coalition in particular, who, who said in interviews in the last 24 hours, look, metadata is collected by lots of organisations and stored. I mean, I think people have more to worry about what Google and Facebook are doing with, <laughs> with, with, with the information that they collect from us than anything that the government's doing to make a small extension. Well, David here. Irvine, the head of ASIO, has made a similar point, hasn't he? That, um, a lot of this stuff is used for commercial purposes already um, to sell you various things. Surely it should be used to try and save some lives as well. But can I just say, yeah, what, I, what is I agree. I, can I say I agree? <laughs> 
uh, with Julian, and I've, I've got to say, I mean, Paul has thrown more light on this issue in the last five minutes than the Attorney General and the Prime Minister have in the entirety of the last week, and that's a part of the problem. The issue is the way the issue is the way it has been handled. The issue is the way it has been handled, and Julian, I've got to say, you can forgive uh, some people for their uh, confusion and their concern, given the way that this Attorney General and the Prime Minister have rolled out what many see as a perfectly reasonable but proposal. The, the concerns about privacy uh, seem to be that we shouldn't have all these websites looked at. Would you have a problem with? website history being looked at by intelligence agencies, well, access through a warrant. Can I say, say this, David? I see absolutely no justification for treating uh, internet communications in a different way from what we traditionally thought of as telecommunications. Exactly. If anything, it's more, more important. And, uh, and the regime set up that Paul and I are both very familiar with from our history is that if you want to get access to the content of a conversation, you need a warrant. Yes. You need a warrant. And I see absolutely no justification and this is the point that Brett Walker was making right. today. I see absolutely no justification for uh, putting in place a different regime for internet communications. So why then did Labor balk at this? Because it was Nicola Roxon as Attorney General who asked the Parliamentary uh, Joint Standing Committee to look into it, but then dropped it. Hang on. No, let's be quite clear about this. We had a joint parliamentary committee inquire into this in the last parliament, looked at this issue specifically, made two recommendations on it, and the joint parliamentary committee said, look, there was controversy over this issue. They were quite frank about it. They said there is some controversy mm. over this issue. You will need a very tight definition of what metadata is. And Paul, who probably knows more about this than the majority of other parliamentarians, has said, well, it is an issue that you can't be precise about. We need to define it. There needs to be a policy development process about it. And I've got to say um, that the way it was thrown in as a bit of a smother to the 18C announcement uh, earlier this well, week we'll has that, added to the confusion. We'll no, I know we'll get to it, but it has added to the confusion. I believe a, perfect, a perfectly reasonable matter for policy and public conversation was rolled out um, to get some political leverage and to become a political pivot point. OK, but my question to you is... And that is the problem right, with it. But my question that is, is would you have a problem with website history being stored for two years and made available to the spy agencies? Well, to the best of my knowledge, a lot of that information currently is stored by telecommunications yeah, But not, uh, not, not two years mandatory? Uh, well, a lot of it is already can, stored. Can, so you wouldn't have a we problem, can have, presumably, then, with, with asking them all to keep it for two years? I would apply the privacy principle to this. What is the information being stored for and who gets access to it? Mm. They would be my concerns, but, and I think that would be the concerns of most well, of Well, it would be, be police and intelligence agencies. Yeah, uh, but well, actually, you'd be surprised to know who has access to some of that data at the moment mm -hmm. and one of the things that the joint committee looked at is said actually if we're going to review this area we might need to tighten up a whole heap of the agencies government and semi-governmental agencies that have access to that data as it exists but, at the David, moment. Can, can I just add I mean there are there are issues to work through which is why I've said we've got a process to go through uh, to sort out the detail now one of the issues obviously is the cost cost impact yep. on the telecommunications And what's your industry? view on what that would cost? IANET have said it'd be 5 to $10 per customer a month Look, to I'm, do this. I, but I, you've yeah, got the experience I, I'm here. not in a position to pull a number out of the air, but what I can say is there are costs. There are costs because... Uh, the amount that you pay to store data is roughly proportional to the quantum of data you have to store. Right. So if you store it for a longer period of time, so it, a volume of data is being generated every day, every week, every month from all of the calls and all the web sessions. And how long is it kept at the moment? Uh, and that will depend upon the business needs of the individual uh, telco and net service provider. But what it offers, for example, how long do it well, get it Well, it's actually, it, it varies depending upon the, the billing systems. Okay. The, 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 Whether it's a business, a government or a, there's a, a residential there's, So there's customer. no simple answer, yeah. but, but really the point is, at the moment, it depends upon the business needs of the carriers and the internet service now, providers. Yeah. So I, I, I just want to make clear that there are, these are amongst the set of issues we yeah, need to work Yeah, the cost through. issue. And, and you touched on one as well. What's it to be used for? Jane, um, anti-terrorism or terrorism-related offences is the one that's being discussed. Should it also be made available for investigating child pornography? Should it also be made available for uh, murders? I mean, uh, the Attorney-General pointed to the Jill Maher case where metadata was used. Uh, how far do you go with that, though? Do you, do you then 
go to lesser offences, uh, what should it be used for? Well, it struck me that you were making the point that it needs to, there needs to be someone, like a judge, deciding mm -hmm. when a, a police force or an intelligence operative goes to them and says, we want to look at the data on this person, they have to make a case, and a judge has to say, OK, I think that's a reasonable case, I'll give you a warrant, or no, I think you, are, you don't have a proper case, yes, you can't. It doesn't strike me as being particularly complicated. Um, we, we have a process, it works reasonably well, let's have the same process. And can I add to that, Jane, it shouldn't be the Attorney-General, as there's been some speculation today that, it, mm. that, excess, that issues the warrant. It should be a warrant as we currently know it. Correct. It well, should be a warrant issued by a court, a magistrate. There, there uh, are circumstances, Stephen, where attorneys can issue warrants. Um, there are circumstances where other non-judicial figures, yes, say members of the AAT, can issue warrants. I, I'm sure there's some uh, uh, bodies in the telecommunication. And I support quite strongly, this but, is not one of those yeah, instances no. where but, uh, a politician uh, should be issuing a warrant. Well, again, well, I, I just want to make the point. There, there is a set of processes in the Act today, the Telecommunications Inception and Access Act, for example, uh, that specifies uh, particular um, uh, senior officials within agencies uh, who can issue a stored communication request, for example. Now, um, again, these are these are questions of detail, but there is a there's a framework there at the moment. I think it's important to remember that we're not just having a debate about metadata for the sake of metadata. I mean, the, the most chilling figure that came out of that joint press conference was the figure from the Afghanistan conflict where 30 Australians had gone over to Afghanistan, 25 came back, and something like two-thirds of them uh, were then involved in some sort of terrorism-related activity. We've exactly. got at least and 150 And that's been lost in the last it's few days. It's been completely lost. This, this why, why is the government doing it? It is because of a very serious, a very real uh, threat that we're all facing. There are other the government is actually going to move on uh, much sooner than this metadata question. Yeah. Legislation it will introduce uh, to Parliament in the, in the next few weeks. We're going to take a break, but I want to have a quick look at some of those before we move on to some other issues. Stay with us. We've been discussing the uh, anti-terror laws proposed by the government this week, and it's not all about metadata. There are some measures the government's moving on um, more immediately in the coming few weeks when Parliament returns in about two and a half weeks. Amongst those measures, declaring parts of the world essentially terrorist no-go zones. If someone goes there, and presumably we're talking about Iraq and Syria at the moment, you would have to prove that you weren't involved in uh, terrorist-related activity. Julian, what do you think about that idea? I think that's a reasonable thing to do where we are. I mean, given, let's just go back to the context of the point I made before the break. We have at least 150 people that we know, there, there may be more, who have been over fighting for terrorist groups in, in Syria. And that's a real concern for us. And I think there should be, uh, the onus should be on people who are going over to those hotspots to prove that they're going over there for humanitarian or other legitimate purposes. Because um, the, the, the problem with just um, having the law apply as it normally would where, where they'd be able to say, well, uh, the onus is on the state to prove it, is that, uh, you know, it makes things much harder for the state to prove in this instance. And, you know, Terrorism is such a difficult crime to, to deal with and the, the heinous crimes that these people are doing. Uh, and, and, and getting witnesses back in a courtroom indeed, here is indeed. not easy. But where do you draw the line? So would Yemen also be included in that list? Well, there, there Would are, northern Pakistan? There would be processes, presumably, where organisations would be declared terrorist organisations and locations would be declared hotspots yeah. so people knew in advance mm. uh, of where they were going. I mean, you couldn't but suddenly go to France of, no, and be, know, be stuck are, in Paris. You <laughs> there know. are plenty of hotspots, aren't there? There are, there are. And I think people, um, I mean, if a process like that is put in place, that's a fair process for, uh, to exist. In yeah, a so, so, so the notion essentially is that it would be an offence to travel without a legitimate excuse to a designated area where terrorists are conducting hostile activities. So in other words, you would have a determination that would apply to a particular location. But in location. a practical sense... Um... And, and of course that would then be very widely publicly known in Australia and the, th and the rationale for it is because of precisely what we're seeing now. Mm. As Julian said, there's, a, there's estimated to be yeah, some look, 150 and in, Australians. And in theory that sounds good. I'm just wondering in a practical sense, say my... Um, my sister uh, just lost her family in Iraq. They'd, they'd been uh, hit by the, the um, Islamic State organisation and, and she needed help and I went over to try and help her. How would I then prove that? Well, well, to I the authorities back here, that, go, I, that I was actually yeah. legitimately going to see my well, sister. I think you'd, you'd go through precisely the things that you've, you've gone through now. Um, but how do you prove that? 
uh, well... Do you uh, heard to write a letter or, I mean, how do you... David, there'd be some easy ways. I mean, people who travel now register with DFAT that they're travelling in the first place. You could, um, you know, register with DFAT to say that you're going over to visit your sister. You'd have something contemporaneous that demonstrated that, that you were going for a legitimate purpose. But anyone so could, anyone buys could a around the world ticket. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They buy a around the world ticket. It just seems there's, there's, yeah, most, there's a few uh, grey areas. Yeah. 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 And sh yeah, I mean, can, terrorists can, are generally yeah. pretty clever no, about hiding David, their tracks. David, we, can, <laughs> we can go through the intellectual exercise of conducting uh, cases which uh, test how this might work yep. uh, but I think the, the key point is we have a serious threat to yeah, the but safety how it of works is important how, how it works, works is important. at the end of the day yeah, yeah. 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 David look uh, I have absolutely no problem with the objective of uh, preventing, dissuading uh, and penalising people who are Australian citizens who go off and fight as terrorists in another country no problem with that so ever I do have issue with the detail. Who prescribes the country, for example, or the location? Uh, and it's not so difficult to look back in time. Take the uh, apartheid era, apartheid era in South Africa. If a particular government had its way back then, perhaps we would have prescribed the entirety or parts of South Africa oh, as South a hotspot. No, 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 but no, it is a very no, significant no, no, I take question. Your, I take your point. Does the Prime Minister do it or does the Parliament do it? Yeah, but is it the Attorney but General Stephen, or the Foreign the, Minister the is, who the makes the decision? Stephen, the, the key Palestine, point is, the it's, West Bank. It's a uh, there'll be a statutory process set out. A determination will have to be made. And I've already made the point. I have no problem with the objective. The the details can be, are very, can be very challenged important. in the court. In other words, this is not something that will be done lightly. But and what's your understanding no, of it? Would it be the him. foreign minister who says it, it you can't go to ministerial? As I understand, right. Yes, so it's right. not the department. It's the politician who well, says you can't go to Gaza or you can't go to. It worries me. These things should be matters of public debate. It worries me. I mean, I accept that there's a reason I understand what you're trying to do, but the first thing I think is if a young hothead is absolutely determined to go, they'll find a way to go. Yep. And yep. that's all fine and we can, you know, make laws. And no, no, that's true, but the but, problem is that we have real, we really struggle I, I, to get on top okay. of that and deal with those people I, and particularly the threat they present when they come back to Absolutely, us. and I understand what you're trying to do and I'm not saying I'm totally against what you're attempting. However, what are we fighting the terrorists about? What, what, what do we want to protect? We want to protect what I thought was our rights to live as individuals and to decide our own fate and to travel as we would like to. So whilst this may be a necessary thing that we need to do, we need always to be checking, are they winning by default by making us very slowly, inch by inch, um, restrict our own freedoms out of fear of what might happen? Sure, but I think most people's concern is they're seeing these guys waving around heads that have been yeah. cut off. They don't want them coming back here and staging any sort of attacks, uh, any it's attacks in, here. In, incredibly hard to imagine yes you could get a couple coming and they could do something terrible of course it could happen and that's why I'm saying I'm not necessarily against it but the only thing I would keep saying to people is don't forget that our freedoms are important and we can't selectively apply and then restrict them without careful thought I think I think you make an important point we are uh, this is a, a a fight over values in many ways mm -hmm. and amongst the values we're defending are the values of living in a liberal democratic nation with all of the freedoms that come with that so we need to obviously think carefully about um, that balance and preserving that balance so those factors certainly need to be taken account of in the way that this provision is is drafted uh, and of course um, there will there will be the capacity to challenge in court a determination and you've also got additional oversight mechanisms like the inspector general of intelligence and security you've got the joint parliamentary committee um, they're retaining the position that brett walker has held which which is going to over oversee the the legislation and so on and he said again today that he he thought the quality of the parliamentary oversight, which surprised me that, that Brett Walker would say this, that the quality of the parliamentary oversight of these things is actually quite good in Australia mm. and that we don't give our parliamentarians enough credit for, for their oversight of these. So a journalist mm. could still go, even a journalist for example well, who may want to go and look at Hamas and is seen to be sympathetic to Hamas, there wouldn't be any restriction on that? There's a, a nurse Ever? who goes and works <laughs> in a hospital in Gaza. Mm. Uh, it's not mm. hard to send your mind forward and say okay that's a hot spot yeah, as it is go. at the moment. There's a nurse who is legitimately working in a, a but again, UN hospital but in Gaza. You could, you, could register, you could register with the I Australian think, I think what we need to do is, is pull back and look at 
the purpose for which this provision is being proposed. And the it, objective and is not the problem. Yeah, there's no doubt about yeah, that. But my point is that you then test legitimacy against the objective. Mm. The objective is to be able to get on top of Australians engaged in terrorist activity mm. in parts of the world where terrorist activity is occurring uh, and then you test against that any of the other kinds of activities you've talked about uh, because you're essentially looking to see okay these people are not going to engage in terrorist activity but for another reason. Yeah, the question I, I simply ask the question is this the best way to go about reaching that objective um, and I think that needs careful thought and, caref and a hell of a lot of sunlight a hell of a lot of public debate because we can all turn our mind back and our minds forward to sort circumstances where individual members of governments might take a view about uh, a political conflict in a country um, which a decade Northern down Ireland. the track, a decade down the track, another government, another people might take a different, particular, completely different uh, and, and, and I guess what we can also do is we can also South look, Africa, at, Northern Ireland, look at the fact two that examples. we have clear evidence of a problem with a, 150 Australians now estimated yeah. to be in fighting in Iraq and Syria. And that and, and, and we and agree just, with you, Paul. Paul we agree that, that we do not want to encourage people to They're estimated to be 30 to 35 in Afghanistan, so we've seen a considerable acceleration. Mm. This is an exquisitely difficult, relatively new problem mm. and it threatens the safety that we take for granted in Australia. Yeah, no, there's no doubt, but you know, clearly you've got to take your time to get it right. Yes. Uh, here when the other here. thing I don't want to see is it becoming a disincentive for people to go and do humanitarian work in those places. Correct. In other words, that the bureaucracy or the uh, getting off permission becomes so difficult that uh, nurses, doctors, uh, humanitarians, Engineers, all sorts of people to go, it's too hard, we're not going. Uh, I think that just would be a shame. Again, it's hotspot plus legitimate purpose. If you can yeah. show a legitimate purpose, yes. it's not about that getting permission, you have to yeah. show the legitimate yeah. purpose. Yeah. So if you're a nurse or a journalist or, a, or, or an aid worker, mm. they are legitimate purposes. Mm. All right, let's family. move it on. Let's family. move it on. Now, uh, 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 Stephen uh, mentioned part of the announcement the other day was also that the government is dumping the proposed changes to the Racial Discrimination Act. Now, Julian Lisa, on this program previously, you were one of the fiercest critics of what the government was doing here. What do you think actually led in the end to this being dumped? Uh, I think it was undoubtedly um, the fact that there was such a large public backlash against the proposed changes to Section 18C. You had basically every ethnic community in the country, uh, you had 5,000 submissions made to the inquiry and I think that the government listened and heard that, that this was not, not a tenable position and that what they were trying to do couldn't be supported. Was that about it, Paul Fletcher? Uh, look, I think it is true that there was very widespread uh, ethnic community concern, concern from many, many different groups and uh, I had, as many parliamentarians had, visits from uh, groups of community leaders so raising their So you were worried concerns. about this as well? Um, I, I certainly saw the evidence of concern and disquiet. Were you uh, worried about it? Um, well, I, I certainly saw the evidence of, of, of concern. What was your view though? Well, my view was uh, that it was a factual matter, that it was causing a lot of uh, disquiet. You're allowed to have a view on this, though, whether it was the right thing to do or not. Uh, well, uh, we've now taken a decision, which I think is the right one, to uh, that this priority we took to the election needs to come second to another competing priority, which is preserving Australia's safety. Does that mean it was the wrong thing to put it forward? Uh, look. In a democracy, you put up ideas, uh, you put up proposals. Uh, I think the uh, philosophical arguments in favour of freedom uh, are ones that I certainly find appealing. Uh, but we went through a consultation process, we got a very clear message from the community, uh, and at the same time, uh, we became concerned that the disquiet in the community about this issue was compromising our capacity to pursue measures directed to achieving Australia's safety. Jane, Andrew Bolt, uh, who of course uh, was the case uh, the, yes. that uh, involved him that led to all of this, uh, his response to that, he's been quite critical of the government mm. dumping this uh, change, he's said um, in his column today essentially that, uh, well what now, we're not allowed to criticise um, the uh, the rate and the and the source of Islamic migrants to Australia that that would not be allowed. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think th he's... this is going to be a no-go zone now for legitimate debate. No, uh, he's you know putting up a straw man. I think for effect. Uh, look, 
it's really interesting. I was used to be a complete free speech, open slather, anything is allowable, even yelling fire in a crowded cinema I would argue in favour of, until the debate about 18C. And then I changed my mind the other way. And the reason was that I actually met someone uh, from an Indigenous background, we were going to be on a panel together, and she had seen in a uh, program of the, of the panel that one of the other panellists was a, was described as a friend of Andrew Bolt's. This Indigenous woman turned out that she wasn't, but this Indigenous woman said to me, I've restricted what I'm going to say. I will not say what I was going to say because I'm so frightened of how it could be used against me. And what I suddenly realised with blinding clarity was that freedom of speech for the privileged amongst us actually restricts the freedom of speech of other people who feel vulnerable, who feel less confident about their ability to stand up to the kind of uh, criticism that, they, that she was clearly expecting. Now, she may have been completely wrong in her perception of what was going to happen, but it really made me think that my open slather freedom might feel good to me, but in fact, it has a limiting effect on other people's freedom of speech. But do you think that the way the act That changed is, my mind. But is the way the act is written at the moment where it, um you're not allowed to offend someone on racial grounds. Does that go too far? Oh, look, I thought the, uh, the campaign of the Attorney General, which he's still running, mind you, he's out there today defending uh, his championing of the rights of bigots. Uh, I think it was a solution uh, in search of a problem. Uh, the laws have served us well uh, for well over 30 years. Uh, there are carve-outs, exclusions within the prohibitions which permit free speech. Let's not forget that in this country and any others uh, that we like to compare ourselves to, we have never had untrammeled free speech, the freedom to say whatever we like without comeback or penalty. The laws of slander, of libel, of defamation have always restrained uh, our ability to say whatever we like. Uh, and in a civilised society, the laws against discrimination and hate speech should be added uh, to those other restraints. I think every uh, person who has turned their mind and looked at the details of the legislation has reached that conclusion. Uh, the most unfortunate thing about uh, uh, this debate, as you have said, Jane, is it has been, well, I don't, and I don't for a moment say that this was the Attorney General's intent, but it was certainly the result. It sent comfort and succour to bigots out there who wanted to th say yeah, exactly mean, what yeah, they like. That, that, that was the result. That was the result. I do I not say that that, that, that was his intent, too. but that was the result. And why have that the communities jumped up, including yeah. yours? Why have they jumped up and made such uh, a show about it? Because that was what was happening well, out there. Yeah, look, I, I don't dispute it was not communicated well or handled well this uh, this argument necessarily, but. Uh, should we be allowed to have free speech to the extent that you can offend someone? Well, this is not general offence. This is uh, offence on racial grounds. It's offend, insult or humiliate on racial grounds. And uh, as I said on this program previously, if it was something that was trying to um, cull political speech and the examples Andrew Bolt gave, you can still have debates about the level and mix of migration in this country. You can still call somebody an Islamic terrorist. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. But it is... Um, uh, there are certain immutable qualities that people have and the race is one of them uh, and that's not something that should be the matter of, uh, uh, of debate uh, at a level and, and it is a level that is higher than just oh, saying a racist joke or yeah. something like mm -hmm. that that offends, insults or humiliates. Yeah, it, well, you it... can still offend me on gender grounds. That's perfectly legal. <laughs> well, indeed, you can do indeed, that. Can't no worries at all. Uh, on my own is, this, is this gone for... We can change politics. Uh, well, I can't well, change my gender. That expense. The decision's made. We won't be coming back to it. All right, on that note, we'll take a break. We're going to turn then to the, uh, the budget debate, which is ongoing during this winter recess of Parliament. Joe Hockey's uh, trying very hard to win over some of the crossbenchers. I also want to talk about the surrogacy debate as well, with the rather disturbing case of baby Gammy. Stay with us. with us tonight. We're talking to Paul Fletcher, the Parliamentary Secretary for Communications, a columnist and author, Jane Caro, Julian Lisa, former head of the Menzies Research Centre, Stephen Jones, the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Regional Development and Infrastructure. I want to talk about the budget. Uh, the Education Minister, Chris Pine, this week has signalled there's likely to be some movement on the higher education reforms. At least he's willing to negotiate on this in the Senate and, uh, and see parts of it 
uh, give way to, to keep the thrust, I think he said, of, of the package in place. One area where there's been most criticism, it seems, is uh, the interest rate on hex debts. Uh, at the moment, it's a no real interest, isn't it, on, on your hex debt, so take as long as you want to pay it back. There's no real interest rate. But the government wants to move to a, um, uh, a rate that would be maximum at the, at the government bond rate. The point that's been made is that for women in particular, take time out of the workforce to raise kids. Uh, they are then going to take longer to pay back their debt and the, the interest bill mounts during that period. Paul Fletcher, um, are you going to have to give this one away, do you think? Well, look, the, the starting point for the uh, position that was announced in the budget, obviously, is, as you say, that today, if you incur a debt under the fee help scheme, mm -hmm. then it, it uh, compounds at just a CPI, the rate of inflation. Yep. But the government is borrowing money to pay for it at the long-term government bond rate, about 3.4%, and so that's costing more money each year. So the proposal has been to increase the rate uh, that is charged... Uh, the interest rate that's charged on the loans um, so that it matches the bond rate. Now, as to the question of what uh, Minister Pine said this week in a major speech he gave at the, at the uh, press club to the higher education sector, um, he talked about a willingness to uh, engage with the crossbenchers in particular um, in terms of elements of his package. Mm. Uh, he also said he wasn't going to be negotiating through the media. Um, you can, no, I but, mean... Uh, uh, so I won't be either. <laughs> all I won't right. be either. But, right. but, uh, but he has signalled that willingness. Yeah, and, and <coughs> Jane, it would seem on this one in particular uh, that it'd be uh, one the government is more likely to move on. I would hope so, because I think the problem for women is really large. Uh, as you point out quite rightly, they um, leave the workforce more often and therefore the compounding interest rate, the, the degrees will cost them more. But worse than that, we know that over their lifetime, because we don't have equal pay for equal work, they earn about a million dollars less than men, university graduates across their lifetime anyway. A million? So, so about that. I I haven't looked that up recently, but I'm pretty sure it's about that. And so what that means is they would be paying more for degrees that were worth less to them in terms of actual earned income from those degrees. So the double whammy on girls go thinking about going to university is outrageous. Could you have a pause on the interest that's being uh, compounded and accumulated while you're out of the workforce? That might be one solution, but I think as long as as long as we don't have equal pay for equal work, yeah, we ought to need we, we're going to have to give women a discount. We're going to have to say, well, if we pay you 17 cents less in the dollar, we're going to have to charge you 17 percent less on your interest rate. Otherwise, what it does is it is a disincentive for women to go to university. Now they are actually doing better at school and university. Jane is right yeah. to, to raise the equity issue, but of course there's another very important equity issue, which is equity between those who go to university and those, and, who, don't. And those mm -hmm. who don't. Those who go to university find themselves on typically a much higher earning path. Yep. Uh, they earn a lot more over their lifetimes than those who don't, and yet at the moment they're being very heavily subsidised. Uh, Stephen Jones, that's, that's true as well, uh, isn't it? That um, those who do go to uni earn more, the taxpayers are subsidising them. Well, uh, and there is a public benefit uh, in the taxpayers subsidising our higher education system. It leads to higher productivity, uh, higher rates of economic growth, and the nation as a whole benefits. So the but public th th those people, case, those individuals, benefit more than the others. If I, if I could go on to say, and they pay higher income tax as a result of those higher earnings, because we have a progressive. Uh, uh, income tax system. But I've got to say, um, my concerns with the overall higher education package is uh, that it puts even more and more obstacles in the way of people from modest and middle backgrounds going to university. Jane, you've mentioned the instance of women. Well, people who are trying a second go at education are also disadvantaged. They're entering, they've probably started the workforce. Maybe they've come from a trades background or a low school background and said, well, I didn't do so well at school, but I'm going to have a crack at university now. I might be in my late 20s, early 30s. I've got a mortgage. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to pay back uh, that loan over the course of a reduced a working, life. working uh, lifetime. Second point, will it be effective? Because we've seen what happened in the UK when they went down a similar path, um, instead of the government regaining the uh, revenue, the additional revenue that they thought they would, we actually saw a blowout in the bad debt rate.
Uh, and we predict that we'll see a similar situation here. Their uncollected debt uh, in, through higher education loans in the UK is north of 30 per cent. I believe we suspect... in the US they're absolutely astronomical too, the accumulated so, debt. There's got to be a better way to do it. One of the points to make here though is about this package is designed to expand the higher education system and give more people the opportunity to get well, that, education. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and that's what we shouldn't lose um, in this debate. It's part of a big package. It is part of a, a, a very and, and significant package. The involving. biggest part of that is obviously the deregulation yeah. of universities, allowing them for the first time uh, to charge what they want for each course. Now, Julian, You've got some skin in the game here, we should... Uh... I work in the sector, so I should at least say that. Um, yeah. Most university vice-chancellors, um, ex with, with very few exceptions, support the package of deregulation. The, the deregulation The deregulation package. Yeah. Um, if you look at the history of this, the idea of fee deregulation goes back to the fight back package. Um, the idea of a deregulated university market was put forward by David Kemp. Julia Gillard did the first half of it, which was the deregulation of student places mm. through the demand-driven system, and that was, a, that was a good reform of the previous government. It's probably the best thing, one of the best things the previous government did. This is the second half of it. If people can compete on course quality, they should also be able to compete on price. That means that uh, some universities that have high research um, requirements and that uh, can charge a premium will do so, and other universities will say, look, we've got a larger scale, we can admit more students at a lower price. And that could benefit some students. And that will benefit students, it will benefit the sector, and it will create a greater diversity in the sector as well. We've got 39 universities, but we can't have them all doing exactly the same thing. Well, yeah, um, and, and different they universities. Exactly. They can't, they can't, uh, but, and, and they don't know, but this will further get specialisations mm -hmm. and drive centres of excellence in different universities. We do have a very different university board. sector to the, to the US, uh, for example, when it we comes do, to absolutely. diversity. You, you, and, you do and have... And greater uh, equality when it comes to access. Can I raise one point that uh, every Vice-Chancellor to a person is, has opposed? and that is the cutting of uh, the government payments, the per student payments uh, to the universities by on average 20%, uh, some of it up to 30% per student. What this means is that every the universities are going to have to pass that cost onto the student. So from next year, every student is going to have uh, on average 20 to 30% increase uh, in, their, in their tuition costs. Now, it's a strange way to increase the equity and access to the system by increasing the price by a minimum of 20 to 30 per cent uh -huh. and then increasing well, the interest Steve, to pay really, on that really it, a very strange way yeah. First of all, this is going to make it more equitable. Increase the size of the system, give more people the opportunity to get an education. Secondly, it's going to allow the vice chancellors and the universities to manage themselves with greater autonomy, identify their particular competitive niches because not all wisdom resides in Canberra and it does make sense to have the universities working out the best way forward for themselves sure, and for their there, students. There's no, no argument though with that element of the package. The, the Commonwealth under, under Chris Pine's model would drop its uh, proportion of funding to 50 per cent. There is and then the offset obviously is the capacity to increase fees and what we're proposing overall as the Minister said this week is that today on average the taxpayer pays 60 per cent of the cost of a degree and the graduate pays 40 per cent. We're proposing to shift that to about 50-50. Yeah, so, so for the student, for the student they are going to face a higher cost. Can you, name one, university, can you name one university in Australia that is going to reduce its fees as a result of this package? No university said anything about what it's going to do with fees because the, the, the system, we've still got to see what comes out of the Senate but yet, and I think not wait and see. University I still, will I, be able to I'm a very, very old-fashioned person. I don't think education is a market or should be a market. I actually think education is the way you prepare people to work in the market. And I really am very, very concerned that the problem with competition is that the people most in favour of any competition are those most likely to win it. Um, and those who are most likely to lose in a competition are those who are losing already. We, you know, we're gutting TAFE, we're, we do not have those, those opportunities for kids who are never going to go to the university sector. We need to have places for kids to go to learn and to maximise their ability to operate within the market and be equipped to operate within the market but rather is, than handicapping is, But it them. is already an international market that they're operating in no, and, and, and Australian be. universities are dropping down that international well, ranking. Uh, yeah, but what it's so important that we have a world competitive <laughs> university system. Well, we, Actually it's really important that, that, that we educate please, our kids higher properly. education um, is up there with iron ore in terms of uh, okay, our expertise. Exactly. Right, yeah, we, exactly. we do very, very well and we have one 
you to do well. And what is the is that the measure? Well, the measure? Well, well, what other measure is well, there? Well, yeah. Are we turning out students the who are who of our, our great university citizens? system is a critical issue, our not just for students, but for our national economic performance. If you believe that we are increasingly going to depend upon intellectual property, returns to knowledge for our future prosperity, then having a world competitive university system is critical. But That's we, why we Christopher do, Pines we, moves we do have so a world important. competitive university sector because it is one of our biggest exports. And one of the reasons it is, is because it has, is actually rather well regulated. And people feel they can trust the, the university sector here to actually deliver the right side of courses. Now the problem with deregulation, if we go too far with it, is we end up with a whole lot of dodgy practitioners and we ruin the reputation oh, so of what we export. Oh, okay. We saw that in the not university sector. Yes, yes, we saw it in the private providers, yes, just, absolutely. You, you, you've still got the regulatory system there of, of TEXA, the, the, the regulatory agency that will be overseeing this, so there's not going to be some sort of uh, race to the bottom here as a result of this. But what you do want to see is you want to see difference in the system. You yes. want to see some universities saying, look, we are great at engineering and specialising them yeah. in engineering and marketing that as their specialisation, not doing 75 other different things, some of which they are Then we're going to have to change the way Australian kids go to uni because at the moment well, Australian that's, that's kids right. don't travel to go to university. That's right. And that's why the universities are fairly generalist because they that's tend to go and, to the university and, and, you know, where the they live. The government in have the you scheme, talked about this with Australian parents? The government in the scheme has, has factored things like this into it. There's the Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme. One dollar in every five that the universities charge a student Student, we put together in a Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme for equity places to acknowledge that there's going to be changes in, in, in student behaviour patterns around accommodation, around support for more students and so on. There's a balance in the package. It's not a perfect package, but you know it's a package that's got reasonable support of most of the sector. I, I come from regional Australia. I did my first degree at a regional university and I, like thousands of other kids who came from the Illawarra, probably wouldn't have gone to university mm -hmm. had there not been a first class university in my region yeah. offering a broad range of courses. About there not being a first and class the, university and the point well, is, well, this, this is the debate. Actually, actually that is Paul Fletcher, this is the debate. It, it seems just listening to the debate around the, the table. The debate streets. is whether we have, like the school system, uh, the aim being a quality education available for all Australian um, well, of course we students. Want every We've already stuffed that up. To get the best possible education <laughs> That's a different debate. We all, or do, we want, do we want to have a system in higher there. education where we have some centres of excellence, some universities that are more qualified or more suitable uh, to, to kids who um, you know, aren't going to go on a research degree, uh, different we standards of universities. We can do that without sacrificing equity of their and, and access. And where we, we let the university universities themselves work out what they're good at, what their strengths are, what they're going to be competitive at. Take a university like James Cook, for example, with strengths in, in tropical medicine and those right. kinds of I, things. We, I've got to move it on because we're running out of time, but I, I did want to get your thoughts too on this surrogacy debate, the, the fairly disturbing uh, story of baby Gammy. Uh, born in, in Thailand to a surrogate mother, a West Australian couple, uh, some confusion about whether they knew or didn't know that there was a, a twin in this pregnancy. They've taken the little girl, the healthy uh, little girl, back home. The father, as it turns out, has been convicted, we now know, on 22 child sexual abuse charges. He was jailed for a number of years as well. Uh, this afternoon we hear that the, the family, the, the, this couple, have now made contact with the uh, Department of Child Protection in Western Australia. Jane, to you first on this, is there any law change that could be made to prevent this happening, do you think? It's an incredibly difficult question and I don't have any kind of solution. I almost think it is a wisdom of Solomon, almost literally kind yeah. of thing because, you know, where there is demand there will be supply. And there's always going to be that where couples can't uh, get pregnant, can't, IVF doesn't work, they're desperate to have a kid understandably, there's going to be demand. And we have unfortunately great inequities in the world. We have women who've realised that they can in fact earn money from their yep. womb. Um, that's going to happen in the same way that we unfortunately have people who sell their organs. You know, that's against the law, but it still occurs. Mm. And people who are desperate enough will go and find them. So there's huge problems with this. And some surrogacy is wonderful and works really well. We've had stories like baby Alice, who was one of the very first, and that was her, yep. her mother's sister. Her, and that was all without any problem and no commercial transaction. There is something horrible about the idea of buying a, a baby. Um, but you're just not sure whether it's. But I, I, I don't have a solution for no. it.
There was some, there's been some debate this week about whether we should extend the application of the laws that currently exist in most Australian yeah. states uh, to, to Australians overseas, whether they have some extraterritorial effect. And it has a superficial attraction to it. And that is, to be simple, to, to put it in very simple terms, you cannot do this on a commercial basis. If you yeah. can't yeah. do it on a commercial basis in New South Wales, Doesn't mean it no happen, Australian should be able to go overseas yeah. and do well, the same thing. It will thing. happen, though. The problem with that, it has a superficial attraction. How do you enforce it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, if somebody does it, do you, uh, you confiscate the child and send them home? Who, who are you punishing if you do that? So I think it is the sort of thing that we should be dissuading. I'm just not convinced that the criminal law is a very good way of doing it. Yeah, well, look, I, mean, I think the extraordinary thing here is that the development of technology and, and uh, medical technology here, biotechnology, uh, has created this uh, remarkable situation that none of us could have envisaged 20, 25 yeah. years ago. Uh, but I, I, I suspect we're going to be seeing more of these unprecedented situations as medical science continues to develop. On that note, we might wrap it up. Uh, I think there's general agreement on that topic, at least. Paul Fletcher, thank you particularly thank for you. battling through uh, the um, effects of a cold, <laughs> injecting us <laughs> with the debate as much as you can. Jane uh, Caro, Julian, Lisa, Stephen Jones, thank you all very much. Thanks for your thank company you. as well. We'll be back same time next week. See you then.